Hello everyone, welcome to the Geoecologist. I am Dr. Krishnanand and you have been watching my videos on physical geography. So in today's session, we are going to talk about a very interesting concept that is the concept of geotectonics and the geosynclines. So the concept of geosynclines includes its types and several theories of various scientists. So in today's session, let's learn the basic concept and all these theories. But before we go ahead, do like and subscribe to our channel and don't forget to share the videos with others as well. So now, today's question in this session is that what is geotectonics? We have learned about the concept of plate tectonics. Then what is this different than plate tectonics or is it related to it? So let's understand the concept of this geotectonics and geosynclines. So geotectonics deals with the Earth's crust as dynamic system. That is the first important statement to remember and it is formed and deformed as a result of rather slow processes that we have talked under the previous lecture on diastrophism and earth movements. So what we see? This is the sequence that is being studied in the geotectonics. What is that? A phase which is pre-geosynclinal phase when the geosynclines are not there. So what happens then? Then how these geosynclines are formed and then what happens afterwards? So that is post-geosynclinal formation. So we are going to learn about these three important concepts and oceanic type of crust remember those are basaltic layer are pre-geosynclinal stage then continental type of crust that we study as granitic layer they are in the geosynclinal stage so let's understand in detail this concept of geotectonics and geosyncline furthermore so when we talk about geosynclinal theory one name keeps up coming again and again is the name of this scientist Kober. so he was a german geologist in his book der Bau der Erde basically talking about this geosynclinal theory. So it is based on the forces of contraction produced by the cooling of the earth. So remember when we talk about this geosynclinal theory of Kober, it talks about when earth cooled gradually. So what happened? They contracted. So which were those objects which were far now coming together. So what we see is that this kratogen or the concept of this kraton was first proposed by Leopold Kober in 1921 and this concept of kratogen or kraton was there. So it was discussed, it was described as the stable continental platforms. Remember various surfaces of lithosphere which are stable continental platforms that keeps on moving on the deformed layer that is the asthenosphere so that we know now but then it was talked about as cratons so these were the stable continental platforms so this formation was called cratonization and how this happened by the gradual cooling of the earth so these cratons were formed so he called these mobile zones of water as geosynclines or orogens where all the sediments were there from these particular land masses that we see, the continental masses. So these mobile zones of geosynclines were surrounded by rigid masses termed as kratogen. So these kratogens were there and in between these kratogens, these mobile zones of water was there. So one was the land portion, the other was the water portion. And remember, due to this erosion of these lands, the deposition went to this water portion, which is called geosyncline. So kratogen and geosyncline was this concept discussed by Leopold Kober in 1921. So Kober attempted to elaborate various aspects of mountain building, that is the orogenetic process that we study. So first was the formation of mountains. The second was their geological history and evolution of their development. So that was important in this concept of Kober. Furthermore, what we see is pair of another scientists that talked about this geosynclinal theory's fundamental concepts. It was introduced by James Hall's presidential address for the Geological Society of America in Montreal in 1857 only. So remember, this was not new concept. The concept has been built earlier by these scientists, that is James Hall and James Dana. So this Hall and Dana concept is supposed to be the origin point. But further, the more validated concept was given by Kober. So Kober's name is often associated with this concept of kratogen and geosynclinal theory as a more validated concept. So origin of this concept is credited to these two scholars that is James Hall and James Dana. So what he talked in this presidential address, it states that the direction of a given mountain chain corresponds 
to the original line of greatest sediment accumulation. So what he said was that by learning the direction of a particular mountain chain on the earth's surface, what we can say that this particular portion must have been the original layer of sediments earlier deposited. So what was that? If we see this concept, basically that was the water body in which the sediments from these lands were deposited. So James Dana helped clarify this theory in his final edition of his work in 1895. So remember, almost 40 years of work went into this concept to clarify this idea in this manual of geology by James Dana. So that's why James Hall and James Dana's concept is the foundation stone of this geosynclinal theory on which in 1921 further details were given by Leopold Kober. Now let's learn about this important life cycle of these geosynclines, their processes. So remember, first is the sedimentation, then subsidence and compression folding and denudation. So these are the five steps which is important to understand the story of geosynclines. So geosynclines may pass through all these important cyclic events that keeps on happening. So what we studied here is if these are important keratogens and this is the geosyncline, so what happens? The sedimentation happens first. The sediments through this process of denudation, the erosion, it deposits here and then gradually because they are moving and when they compress each other, this part is now going up. So this is where the mountains are formed. So let's understand these processes further by this particular diagram. So what we see, this compressional forces coming here. So what we see, surrounding highlands are there, the cratogens, the cratons, from where these sediments are deposited in this geosynth line. So which is like a depression here. So these sediments are deposited and further these compressional forces. Now, remember these are gradual forces. It takes millions, thousands of years to actually make them uplift. So what happens? These sediments are further pushed and they rise up. So we see these fold mountains and furthermore features on the Earth's surface. So what we learn is the important principles of the theory. So remember these particular principles, the presence of geosyncline, that is geosynclinal system, then mobility, that is the movement that we saw in compression forces, then these particular deposits in these geosyncline, then their thickness variation also there, because these layers and layers after sediments are gradually deposited. So there is a variation in thickness as well. Then further what happens? They are forming this particular folds because of this compression. So these layers are now being folded and that is what we study in the orogenic process. So increment to the continent that is consolidation happening. So that is another important principle. So these are important features that are associated. These are important principles of this geosynclinal theory. Next thing that we need to remember is that geosynclines are further classified into these important types. So myogeosyncline, eugeosyncline and orthogeosynclines. Now let's learn about these types of geosyncline. What are these myo, u and ortho? So if you want to remember, this is the shortcut MEO. So this is MEO classification of geosynclines. So it depends upon what factors. Now factors are important here. The rock strata, the location and nature of the mountain system. So that is important. So we can study from these three important things about these particular geosynclines. So myogeosynclines, the first one, comprises of what factors? Comprises of what kind of stones? Sandstone, limestone and shale. So remember, sandstone, limestone, shale are belonging to myogeosynclines. Then eugeosynclines are composed of thick sequences. Remember, they are thicker in nature. So they are deep sediments in the marine areas. So they are deeper and thicker because layer after layer depositions lead to this formation of eugeosynclines. And then we have orthogeosynclines. Remember ortho related to the shape. So they are linear geosynclinal belts. So that is what we study in the classification of the geosynclines, myo, u and ortho. So M-E-O that is to remember. Now the concept of another scientist that is E. Hogg. So according to Hogg, geosynclinals are relatively deep water areas, remember water areas and they are much longer than they are wider. So remember their width may not be that 
important but their length is varying so they vary in length so that is important concept given by e hogg and he drew this paleogeographical maps of the world to depict this so what happens he drew the world map stating that how these particular elongated belts existed between the cratogens between these cratons of hard surface that is important so these water tracks were subsequently folded into these mountain ranges why because remember again the principles of this concept that is the sedimentation deposition layering thickness and then further folding so this is what was talked by e hogg he depicted his concept through making this world maps where he elaborated that these water tracks between these major lands these stable lands are those areas where the modern mountains the fold mountains have been formed so now let's look at this particular world map of e hogg that we talked so what is this remember first geosynth line was identified near the rocky geosynth line so this rocky is what we see in the northern america was part of this particular geosynth line these two table lands and in between this particular geosynth line so this was another first elongated feature that we see then there is this ural mountains currently which is part of ural geosynth line then what we see here is another important tethian geosynth line the sea of tethys that we understand between this particular two important continents so that is where himalayan and alps formation we study further what we see is the circum pacific geosynth line so these four geosynth lines were identified in the world map by e hogg what are the names again rockies ural tethian and circum pacific so remember this on the world map now another scientist whose concept is important is this british geologist j w evans so he presented several alternative situations than the already existing so what are that it may be between two land masses that was the first important proposition then it may be in front of a mountain or a plateau that was the second proposition then it may be along margins of the continents and it may be in front of river mouth so four cases were presented by j w evans of the existence of these geosynth line so where it exists between two land masses or maybe in front of a mountain or plateau because remember for geosynth lines the sedimentation is the first important point of the life cycle so the sediments will be coming from where from the erosion of these particular land masses so either it can be two major land masses or it can be a mountain or a plateau font or it can be margins of the continents or it can be a river mouth where we have siltation the sedimentation happening so these are the four cases given by j w evans in his alternative situation concept of geosynth line now another important scientist that is suchard so suchard's view is important and he identified three categories what are these he talked about the concept of mono geosynth line poly geosynth line and meso geosynth line now this is suchard's concept and the earlier concept that we studied as the meo concept remember myo u and ortho so that was given by hollandana on the same basis suchard also developed his concept and he gave these three important categories of geosynth lines so mono geosynth lines as the word is singular mono so they are exceptionally long and narrow but shallow water tracks are there for example appalachian mountain region of present that was earlier a geosynth line that he said then poly geosynth line so poly geosynth lines basically is where you have more than one source of sedimentation so they were long and wide water bodies so for example rockies and ural geosynth lines and further what we see is the meso geosynth line so what are this meso the word is meso means middle or the medium so they are very long narrow and mobile ocean basins which are bordered by these continents from all sides so remember if the question is asked that what is meso geosynth line it is bordered by continents from all side poly geosynth lines they are larger wider bodies and mono geosynth lines are not larger but they are longer they are elongated so remember it is basically talking about the morphology that is again shape basis so one is elongated that is mono the poly is basically wide and large water body then meso is basically bordered by all continents and in between there is a geosynth line so tethian geosynth line is supposed to be of that kind according to the suchard's concept 
So now, after we have learned about the basic concept of geotectonics, the concept of geosynclines, its various types and various theories of different scholars. So now, in the lectures to come, we are going to learn about the concepts of folds, its types, faults and its types and several other concepts. So stay tuned, stay safe and all the best wishes.